The World Economic Forum is very proud to count amongst its communities its young global leaders who are outstanding, outstanding individuals uh, under the age of 40 and its global shapers who are outstanding individuals between the age of 20 and 30. And did you know in India, 50% of the population is under the age of 25 and 65% of the population is under the age of 35. Well, and if there's one thing that the world needs today, that's hope. And young people bring hope. So let's, um, I, well, I hope that all of you enjoy the afternoon with us, with uh, a bunch of global shapers and young global leaders. Enjoy the session. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's always hard to do a post-lunch session, so we're going to try and stir things up here at the Leela. We've got a bunch of very exciting young people, as you can see, on this panel. And we're here to discuss something that very often doesn't get uh, enough thought or attention at forums like this one. We're here to talk about actually something which should be very simple. Uh, we're going to try and attempt to bring solutions to the table as opposed to only talking about and articulating the problems that India is faced with. Uh, the overarching theme for our panel here this afternoon with the young global leaders and the young shapers is the vision for India. I'm hoping that all of uh, our panelists here are not just going to give you what they think is their vision for India, they're also going to talk about what they see are the key challenges or the problems that India is grappling with, but they are also going to bring to the table, as I said, solutions. So we are hoping to keep this as our organizers here have been telling us. Because this is a young panel, it's got to be Facebook and tweet style. So everybody gets just about one minute. So no long winding speeches here uh, this afternoon. Everybody's going to get one minute to talk about their vision for India, what they see as being the big challenges and problems that India is facing, their solutions, and also the one thing that they are personally doing to bring about the change that they would like to see, and perhaps what they're being inspired to do as well. So let me start things off, and let me get uh, one of our youngest uh, uh, global shapers here, and let me start by asking you, Roini, because you've got a very, very interesting mix and a very interesting background. You're involved with sports, you're also involved with medicine. Take us through your story, and through that story, what to your mind should be the vision for India? Your time starts now. So hi, um, I'm, I represent India in the sport of sailing and narrowly missed qualifying for the Olympic Games this year. Um, unfortunately, I blame the federation for lots of, lots of sports federations have issues and lots of sports people have these issues. But I also study medicine and I'm doing my final year of medicine. I think young people, especially girls in our country, need to take up sport. But at the same time, I think we shouldn't let go of our, medic uh, of our education because I don't want to fi finish my sports and then decide, okay, I don't really know what else I can do and blame the government, blame everyone else for, to help me. So I really think it's important that women and girls focus on education and sport and I hope to be a role model for people, uh, for young women all over India. So you, you said, Roini, that you almost missed out on getting to the Olympics this year, and that was because of what you saw as problems within the federations in India. So is it politics, federation politics, and sports organizations that you believe is the biggest problem to your mind? I think so. I think a lot of sports people would say that. I don't want to get into the, uh, you know, the details of that. But I was, I was the only woman civilian. And I was in the middle of, um, you know, a male-dominated uh, society with the army and the navy men. So it was a female uh, civilian versus the army and the navy uh, men. So I think it, there were no guesses who got the support there. Okay. So uh, what, to your mind, would then be the vision for India? What would you like to see as your vision for India? A more equal society where women, irrespective of, uh, you know, gender, irrespective of where they come from, meritocracy, a more meritocracy-based uh, society is what you would like to see? I think um, we need a lot of support, and I'd like to thank mostly my parents for um, letting me take three years longer to finish my course and be okay with it. And um, certain individuals, even though I'm studying in a government university, I, even though so many people said that I shouldn't be doing my sport and concentrate only on medicine, there were a few people who supported me, and I'd like to acknowledge that. So I think um, there is a good 
uh, vision for the future, and I hope a lot more girls and women in India could take it up. Okay, Siddharth Lal, do we really have an idea for India or a vision for India? Because, you know, when, we, when you talk about it in forums like this, you'll have an idea for what West Bengal should be like, what Gujarat should be like, what mm. Bihar should be like. We very rarely talk about an idea for India. It's almost become this nebulous thing that nobody talks about. Yeah, sure. And, of course, everyone knows the potential of the country, and we don't need to talk about that. And everyone knows, like you said, the issues and where the government should focus on, you know, whether it's health, education, safety, that kind of stuff. But I think the catalyst is transparency. And that's the catalyst which is really going to drive this country into a totally different spectrum, as it were. And, and, and that's really where, you know, a lot of the discussion today has been about. And I think that's, that's what's going to empower all of us. So what does it mean? It's, the, it's actually transparency will create a meritocracy. Mm. So politicians are not going to you know, be around because of their ability to fund elections or their, you know, last name or whatever it was. It's going to be because they're good. Um, business people like us, we're not going to be around because, you know, we've inherited necessarily or because, you know, we have, you know, we have the connections or the cronyism and all of that. It's because, we, you know, it'll be entrepreneurs who can really make a difference and who have um, ideas which become big. Mm. So it's, it's really the meritocracy. I think that's, you know, that's, that's really there, and we look at role models because you know we we make um, I guess we play up and we we you know uh, role models who are really not the right people. So now I think like today, for example, we had you know wonderful person like Vinod Rai who's really a role model for this country, mm. and so we need more such positive role models. Does, can I ask you? Does yeah. corporate India need a Vinod Rai? We need lots of Vinod Rai's. <laughs> and, and, and there was a start. I mean, we talked about it today. There was there are five corporates who've, who've signed up. It's, it's a gesture, I mean, to talk about anti-corruption from corporate India. It's the first time a gesture like that's been made. Brilliant. Let's do a lot more of that. Let's make the right gestures. Let's do the right things just so that we have that transparency and, and things will sort itself out. I mean, the country will sort itself out for sure. Okay, so transparency, meritocracy, two ideas there as far as India is concerned. Ashni, let me come to you, add a third one to that, depending on, on, on your story and, and where you'd like to actually see India go from here. Sure. Um, I think the vision for India has to include the idea of self-actualization and self-expression. Um, I think that's just that's a vision for any country or a happy, prosperous country. Uh, but one of the sessions we were talking about the idea of uh, human capital and, and gross national happiness, and I think that people being able to be self-expressed and self-actualized. And I think what, what I mean by that is having access to critical goods and services mm -hmm. without the barriers to access. And that definitely defines my work. Um, I work on uh, developing innovative financial uh, models, innovative financing models for education, uh, particularly in vocational training right now. And uh, part of that is because one of the big barriers to education in India is uh, financing, not uh, being able to invest in your own education and your own training. Yeah. Um, and I think what I feel I can best do right now is help remove that barrier as, as much as I can. And there are similar barriers to healthcare, similar barriers to sanitation uh, that I think need so, to be removed. So do you see a future for yourself partnering with the government? Or do you believe that entrepreneurs like yourself can exist minus the government? I think we can exist, but it, why not partner with the government? Um, the government, especially around skill development, is a many different schemes right now, credit guarantees, a lot of money from the NSTC. Uh, it would make a lot of sense to partner with the government since the, the vision is aligned with what the government wants for the country. Okay, what has been your biggest problem in being able to actualize the dream that you actually have for education? Well, the, the model I'm looking at brings different partners to the table and, and uh, a bank and vocational institute, us as a third party, and when we, do, when we bring different partners to the table, um, it, it slows the process down. Uh, I think it's also uh, the model we're coming up with is actually having different partners take risk and not having the student take the entire risk for their own mm. education. Uh, it's very hard to get people to take risk for the greater good. Okay, so risk-taking ability as well as the ability to partner with various organizations, create partnerships is what you would actually see as being the foundation for a better future. Well, creating partnerships across different sectors. Yeah. So for me, I'd have to create a partnership with the bank um, as, as well as uh, education institutions. And I think so are you, are you work in silos, Are you optimistic work. about the future of India? Are Absolutely. you feeling pessimistic about the future of India? You know, when we read the newspaper headlines, you don't really see much reason for joy, cheer, hope. 
What about you? Are you feeling optimistic about India? Absolutely optimistic. I actually moved, uh, I lived in the US for 10 years after, for college and beyond, and I moved back last year because I'm optimistic about India. All right, excellent. Malvinder Singh, you've been doing this for a while now. Do you share the optimism or have you been jaded already? Absolutely not. I think uh, I'm uh, an optimistic uh, person by nature. I think clearly, uh, for me, I'm a proud Indian. Uh, very proud of the country that we have, the opportunity that lies ahead. But I think more importantly for us is we need to work as, as everybody together as one team for one India. I think we is, many is there times... A one India? Is there a one India today? Let's be honest about that. Is there a one India as today? A, yes, there is. And, and I think we many a times score our own, our own self goals. And I think we need to start taking decisions beyond parties and beyond institutions for our country, for your country, for my country. It's one country, and it's we as Indians who need to make it happen. I have absolutely no doubt over the next 10, 15 years, if there's one country that's best placed to capitalize on the opportunity that's there globally today, it's here and it's in India. We are a country of a billion entrepreneurs, whether it's somebody sitting on a street outside Taj Mahal in Agra, or it's in one of those global headquarters in Delhi or Bombay. It's a country of opportunity. We have to create an enabling environment which empowers people, which makes things happen. And I think our biggest hurdle is if we stop creating and scoring on our, our own self goals, and if we create a more enabling, transparent en environment which allows people so who's going to, to do create, what they want. Who's going to create this more transparent, enabling environment? I think the environment, to an extent, I would say the government, mm. from a governance perspective, from a policy, a liberalization perspective, which will then bring investment from domestic people and from international investors. So if there's one thing we as a country need today, it's investment, it's growth, and it's employment. And that, to a large extent, will, will address many of the challenges that we have as a country. Okay, easier said than done. We were growing at 8%. We're now down to about 6%. Best case scenario, 6%, perhaps even lower than that. We would like to create jobs. We don't know whether we are going to be able to. Nobody talks about creating jobs anymore. I mean, the US elections were fought on how many jobs Romney promised to create and how many jobs Obama promised to create. In India, when was the last time you heard a government get up and talk to you about the kind of job creation numbers that they will deliver on? Why do you want the government to do it? Why don't you ask each of us in the private sector to talk about how many jobs we are creating? How many jobs have you created? We've created thousands of jobs in healthcare, in financial services. And if there's one group that's consistently, over the five years, invested, it's been Fortis and Relega. And in, in, in addition to that, this year itself, we've got close to $750 million of FDI in this global environment as investment in this country. So then why whine about what the government is doing or not doing? Because you're bringing the money anyway, you're creating the jobs anyway, right? It's, this discussion is not about me. It's about the country. It's about I'm, the people. I'm, use, I'm using you as the example representing corporate India and to that representing corporate India on this panel. I think there is, there is a lot that's happening but certainly, we're not capitalizing on the opportunity that we have because of our inherent advantage vis-a-vis -vis other countries in the world. Okay. I personally believe there's a lot more that we in India can do. And I think we need to open up. We need to liberalize. We need to get more investment in. We need to create a more certain and a more stable and a more enabling business environment. And that's really for the government to continue okay. to do and be able to get more confidence so that people in India and internationally bring more money in. All right, so transparency, meritocracy, partnerships, a more enabling environment, a more liberal environment to draw in investments. Four ideas here coming in from our panel. Let me get a fifth one and let me come to you, Priya. Add, add the sixth idea in terms of a new vision, perhaps if that is what is required for India today. Well, I mean, it's not a new vision as much as it is building on other people's ideas. I think the big thing lacking in India today is investment. I, I think, think you just need to move your mic. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, building on other people's ideas. I think the big thing lacking in India today is investment. We invest a tenth uh, uh, as much in cities as uh, any other country. Uh, you know, leave aside even China, but even other Southeast Asian countries, this is desperately lacking. We spend a third as much on healthcare 
as, uh, as China does, a tenth of Western countries. We spend a third on education. The thing that is really lacking today is investment, in, and uh, really investment in urbanization. We have 250 million people in cities, which is going to grow to 500 to 600 million by 2030. There's a, a complete crumbling of infrastructure in the cities. We are here in Kurgan, which feels a little bit uh, yeah. because it's built by individuals, by developers, and then, of course, complemented by the government. But what is really needed is a huge investment in this infrastructure. And unless we do it, we'll still be talking in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years on why we're still at 5% growth. We really do need to go out and say, we have to liberalize the financial markets. We have to deregulate. I read a study done by the World Bank, which says, which surveyed 183 countries. And they said India came 182nd yeah. in ease of doing, doing business, business. Yeah. in enforcing contracts, and 181st in giving construction permits. So clearly, what uh, uh, I should, uh, but what uh, you know, everybody on this group is saying is we have to open up and have ease of doing business. But that's really to bring in capital into the country because the cities are crumbling and we're not investing enough in uh, people to mm. make them realize their full potential. You know, besides the investment part, what about uh, the need for a mindset change. Uh, you know, we had three people talk about education in this country. One of the reasons why education is where it is and why we see such a large supply-demand mismatch in education is that the government still wants to operate with the notion that education is not something that an entrepreneur ought to profit from. Yes. And once you get rid of that mindset, perhaps you will begin to see the supply-demand mismatch change. How much of this is really an issue of changing mindsets, whether it's in government or even within the corporate sector? For instance, and in healthcare, I'll, I'll get you in on this, Malvinder, as well. You know, if you take land from the government and the government then comes in with riders and says you need to provide 25% free beds or cheap beds or whatever the case may be, you accept those demands and then later on don't deliver on them. So I'm saying, does, does it require a change in mindset? And also, this is very clearly an issue where there is a trust deficit. How do you bridge that trust deficit? Yeah. Well, two aspects. One is, I think you brought up a good point, which is, should the government be putting riders when they give land? And I think the answer is very simple. For example, in London, where you build housing, you need to provide affordable housing. In China, when you do it, the government provides rent subsidies. So the issue of giving you know, people a house, you know, Roti Kapra Makan, the, the house, yeah. this has to be something that the government takes on. There has to be policy around it. And affordable housing is a necessary part of it. Yeah. So I'm not one to say the government should not mandate any affordable housing at all, because otherwise it just won't happen. Every housing will focus on the, yeah. on the wealthy. There won't be inclusive growth. So the now, riders are fine. Well, I mean, it really depends. The devil's in the detail on, on all of this, as you know. Uh, but really, I think there has to be a government involvement in affordable housing. There's no question that that cannot be left entirely to the private sector. The private sector cannot afford to do it and will not do it if there are more profitable options. Yeah. But if the, if the laws are clearly stated, if they're transparent, if the mindset is to encourage growth and not to discourage growth, then certainly that's something that the, that the corporate sector lives with throughout the world. We okay. all live with it. So more clarity of purpose and more clarity in policy is what you would add as far as the sixth idea is concerned for the vision for India. Arundhati, build on that. Um, build on that? Well, I'll build on what Ashni said. Okay. Um, my work is a lot around self-actualization as well through mentoring. Uh, we operate on a, I run an NGO which operates on the simple maxim that a lot of people have gone much further than they thought they could because someone else thought they could. And that's the power of mentoring in, in a young person's life. Now, India's had this great tradition of mentoring through Guru Shishya, and uh, we try to put a modern spin on it. What we think is that young people don't need to be sitting at the feet of an adult, uh, you know, receiving all the wisdom. They need to be in an equal relationship. They need the support of adults in their life, pushing them, challenging them and giving them new ideas for how they could grow. Um, what I absolutely hate is how uh, remedial we have become with young people. Yeah. Um, at the age of 20, we think we need to be putting them in a classroom to study soft skills because they've not built it, or life skills because they've not built it in the first 20 years of their education. I absolutely hate that. 
Um, you know, I don't think that we need to be doing that. In one of our programs, we help young people. We've started doing social entrepreneurship mentoring, where our mentees are looking at solving problems in their communities. And they're doing this with mentors, and their mentors are vice presidents in companies. So they're working with this VP on the field to look at problems, to look brainstorm around ideas. And that's the kind of transference of the social and cultural capital that mentors have to mentees. Yeah. So I would love if we were more creative about how we want to uh, self-actualize and help people realize it and not be so remedial about more classroom education and skilling for this and training for that. So, so moral science classes and SUPW classes and all of that, that's just with completely thrown out of the window, right? Thrown out of the window. I mean, we have so much, so much richness in the networks that adults have, but we don't need to be prescribing solutions and putting it into textbooks. We need to be experiencing Should life Should that be the outside. approach as far as the government is also concerned or, or even corporates in general? We have this idea in India of prescription of, 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 you know, of talking down to somebody. Uh, it's not, it never really is a partnership of equals, is it? Right. I mean, I moved from finance to, to youth development largely because of the role of mentors in my life. And the missive was never start an NGO. It was explore what you can do. And, and I realized that volunteering was so impactful. I wanted to make a life out of it. So I think that if we had so many more mentors, you'd feel you'd have so many more empowered individuals and redefining it, because with all due respect to Guru Shishya, we don't need that right now. We need people as equals in, in partnerships. Okay. Uh, equality in partnerships is what Arundhati is proposing here as her idea or her vision. Uh, Praksha, let me ask you, what would your idea or your vision be? Uh, I'll just uh, talk about my background. I belong to a typical Gujarati family, and Gujarati is very well known for business. Yes. <coughs> when I uh, walk up to my father and I said I want to be uh, into the uh, profession of saving environment. That was the shocking reaction that I got from him. Did you say, you have you lost your mind? Yeah, exactly. Because where will you earn your money from? So when we talk about environment, this is the kind of reactions that we normally get from across all the sections of the society. Right from a student to teacher to professor to government departments to corporates to politicians everyone because the way we see our environment the way we price put a price to all yep. the re natural resources it is something that we really need to rework on because we when when we talk about our gdps when we talk about our growth we normally put it in figures uh, we don't really see the real development that is required yeah. that will sustain us for a longer period yeah so uh, what i would like to see is the change in that perspective the way Every one of us, not just me or my father or my family sees at environment, but every one of us, if we put environment as one of the resources, one of the, you know, baseline. Why, why do you think that's the case? Why do you think we don't care enough about the environment? Why do you, and, and it's not just an Indian problem. It's perhaps more of a problem here in India, uh, which is forcing then governments around the world to mandate responsibility on part of corporates, on part of government, and so on and so forth when it comes to environment. Why do you think it's so low down on the list of priorities uh, in India? Maybe because we just have too many problems, is it? Because the way environment reacts to us is not very well understood by us. Yeah. Right. Um, it doesn't say it out, it doesn't speak out, but it reacts. It's on us how we interpret that, right? We have sandwiches in US, we have smog in Delhi. It's just because of the entire farms being, you know, burned in Punjab. We have a very good example in Gujarat wherein we turn this uh, dried farm uh, residues into pallets and we supply it to industries. We have solutions, we have ideas, we have mechanisms, but the only lacking thing is the attitude towards the environment. Mm. If the government puts it in the policy, if the corporates takes it up as a responsibility, uh, or everything will fall in place because at the end we are standing on a land, so we, it our industry is come, standing come, on it land. It comes back then to the point that this is going to be something that has to be mandated. It has to be made into law. There must be penalties if you don't abide by not it and exactly. so on and so forth. It's the not mindset change <coughs> has to be driven by the stick or the carrot. Exactly. But <clears throat> what we believe is that we, we work with schools we, because we cannot go to the politicians or the leaders or the ministers and say that, you know, please change that, what you are doing. It's not correct. So what we have started is we work with schools. We are uh, having a program that is a behavioral change communication program that we work with students for a period of three years. Mm. And during that three periods, we try to bring those environmental manners in those students so that whenever they grow up, any decision that they make, whatever field they are in, whether engineers, whether industrialists, mm. whether in, he becomes a minister. Mm. 
the decisions are somewhere environment conscious decisions so what we try to do here is that we try to put that seed right from the right age yeah and we have social manners we have religious manners we have professional etiquette why don't we have environmental manners yeah so we we try to work on that because at the end it comes everything that we are consuming comes somewhere from the environment the resources okay. that we use so you've been trying to convince students you've been trying to convince governments have you managed to convince your father that this is a good way of earning your living i am doing that since <laughs> not, three years not successfully battle, not won the battle yet no but i am successfully doing it and they are really happy with what i am doing they are very proud of me okay they are very proud of you we are very proud of you as well and thank you very much for sharing your story we've also got somebody here uh, from sri lanka uh, you know how do you see india at this point in time do you see india as this place where there is chaos there is not enough constructive dialogue there's only criticism of what the government should be doing is not doing or what the corporate sector should be doing is not doing do you believe that india at this point in time is being seen as the land of chaos confusion um i think um, india uh, sri lanka has always seen india as a, a very good partner neighbor because we always say that uh, sri lanka india relationship is uh, lost in the mist of time because it goes dates back to uh, the historical texts of ramayana and all that so there is a rich culture which joins both the countries um how i see the vision um, for india is that uh, as a small country i mean we are smaller than uh, delhi new delhi we are 20 million people so um how i see the vision would be india needs to play a better a leadership role a regional leadership role i think in sark uh, to its neighboring countries we want india to be um, a great success as a small nation um, we want india to uh, lead the role of south asia so um, how i say this is um, because india got to see a problem of another country uh, as a problem of their own because you can't we are we say we are connected but we don't sometimes actually mean it and um, we for example india got to recognize issues in pakistan afghanistan sri lanka um they got to talk about it uh, india got to talk as well as the other side i mean um, if you look at the the visas to enter a country india got to give the research visas for pakistanis to come in like sri lanka we have we are give over the counter for any of the countries so like that and we had a, a big trouble with terrorism but we are reforming we are we are trying to introduce new practices we are trying to get things in order okay and uh, that's the first thing a regional leadership i think the next would be getting the basics right like the angarwadis you know the basic um, the 43 million children who is yeah. uh, studying there and um, i think india needs to get that right because that's really important that's the cream of india okay so that's that's everything that you would actually like india to change but is there anything uh, you know by way of a solution that you would actually like to import here from india and take back to you in sri lanka um yeah we imported many things and we've been very successful and one was the education i mean uh, uh, starting from the nehrus and uh, the gandhi i mean the the education the cooperative systems it all came down from india and most of the good practices we have a 98% literacy rate in sri lanka we need to um, yeah we need to we need, we need to import that yeah <laughs> uh, and also the cooperative systems are really good uh, when i visited dangarwari i was comparing with the sri lankan cooperative systems and so i was tr- trying to find a um i mean what was the difference where, where was the where was the issues so actually it was we we empowered the cooperative systems okay. the governments back in 70s 80s so uh, it's a sort of a um gradual empowerment of yeah. the cooperative systems and uh, getting them to do the education because education is a must and yeah. uh, and everybody get engaged in education so uh, so that like that i mean the cultural it is so if you can make a few of those uh, a few of those things and um, make it a cultural 
sort of norm and then so so you're you're essentially talking about changing the mindset as well and institutionalizing some of the changes yes. that you've talked yes. about so that lal uh, you know we have this obsession about talking about history and talking about the past perhaps what india also needs to do a lot more of is look at the future talk about the future we don't do that enough but but that aside uh, you know you talked about transparency and meritocracy i want to now ask you about the one thing that you have done either in your personal capacity or as the as as part of the organization that you currently run to bring about the change that you have talked about this afternoon yeah it's not easy to talk about yourself really so it's so that's uh, but um look transparency is i mean is something i totally believe in and i think that's that's a catalyst which will totally change in there and and certainly you know it's um in in the country it's very difficult to operate i mean i happen to be in a sector i would say it would be one sector which is much more immune from you know let's say from governmental interference yeah i happen to be in a sector which is also relatively immune it's not regulated i mean if you if you happen to be in a regulated segment in sector you are going to be faced with much more moral dilemmas i mean even we are faced with a lot of moral dilemmas in our business but we are able to or let's say let's put it this way um i think in our history we've been able to take a call that you know is it what direction you go on i mean is it is it growth at all costs mm. and and certainly that's not been have our you, approach have you have you lost out on growth because you've decided i won't play the game that everybody else perhaps is playing or that uh you know when you were faced with a moral dilemma you decided to walk as opposed to give in absolutely we've we've lost out on a lot of growth in the past on that but it's now become a source of enormous strength so just to give you an example i'm uh, you know we we got a partner in volvo you know a few years ago in our in our business and and it's based on reputation it's not based on anything else you know so there's so i think it's for us it's more important to build a brand or reputation and with that comes a lot more in the in the long term so so yeah i think um, you know that's certainly the way to go in terms of um, where you know organizations could go in and like i said it's a great start what some of the companies have done this morning or yesterday in terms of actually signing, signing that up. pledge yeah. absolutely brilliant i mean it, it's a wonderful but is there is there something that you've changed in in the manner in which you operate something by uh, you know something in the in the way that you manage your operations a process perhaps to bring about a concrete change to bring about more transparency to bring about more meritocracy within the organization well certainly within the organization that's you know uh, there are many internal processes but in terms of interfacing with the outside actually we try and just keep a low key i mean maybe that's not obvious here because i'm sitting no, with clearly you clearly not you're yeah. sitting in front of a uh, but, 100 people talking about yourself exactly so 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 but try and keep a low key i guess is what what we try and do so that you're not out there in the public domain that much in terms of um, you know and and people do leave you alone beyond a point so you know you can't make a big issue out of it when you're dealing with people but you try and keep a low key but i think if i just take a different move i mean one of the other bigger issues which um you know in addition to this entire transparency thing and going down to my list we talked about health safety education yeah, all yeah. that um one of the areas that i'm particularly focused on as an automobile player and to bring in more consciousness as an automobile player like you know yeah. like the gentleman here doing healthcare and all of that is to say what is our role i mean actually um in india is, is the road safety or let's say it's a road death capital the, the, of of the world yeah. we have 120000 deaths we have uh, 1.2 million serious injuries and we have 12 million injuries on indian roads every single year so that's an area which i'm trying to now it's a long term effort but i'm trying to take a focus on okay. try and see what is it that we can do as an automobile company as an automobile environment to actually bring that down it's more than all the hiv and i don't know yeah. and all these diseases cardio diseases all of the deaths put together cars contribute to more and the and the thing is that the people they're killing most often is the pedestrians so it's not the car it's not yeah. the person in the car who's dying so so that's the one concrete change that you've tried to bring about malvinder saying what is the one concrete change that you've tried to bring about uh you know and you were talking about changing the environment making it more nurturing enabling and so on and so forth have you tried to sell the india story brand india what is the one concrete thing that you've been able to do i think uh, at a global level clearly uh, one has been part along with many other successful and leading businesses uh, to really take the india story global and also to bring global investment into the country but what i'll talk today is on a different point in terms of healthcare 
this is clearly uh, one area where India is quite deficit in terms of the capability, the quality, and the, and the amount of healthcare that's uh, currently available in India. We at a point in time, little over a decade ago, took a conscious call as a business that we wanted to be part of bringing world-class healthcare into India. We were not in the business of healthcare delivery services at that point in time, but today, in little over 10 years, we have created the largest healthcare delivery services company in India, and that came from one purpose. That was to ensure that India and the people in India have access to world-class healthcare, to affordable healthcare and reliable healthcare. And I certainly believe we've done a lot, but yet there's a lot more that we and other people in the industry need to do to make sure that every Indian has access to affordable, high quality healthcare. How much more affordable can you make it? Uh, today, healthcare in India is probably the most affordable globally. Uh, at the price points that you have today, these are comparable uh, and substantially lower by one tenth, one fifteenth to what's available either in the East or in the West. So you're saying can't go any lower than this? It can, and scale will bring that. More okay. scale will, but at this point in time, it's still extremely competitive and affordable. All right, Priya. Well, obviously, in, in my real estate role, we in, invest heavily in infrastructure. We do hospitals, we do schools, we do creches, but. Um, uh, one of my great passions in life is, is really the foundation work that we do, which is in the area of mental health. And I must talk about that because uh, it's really a, a forgotten subject. Uh, mental illness uh, kills more people than smoking. I, and I, I say that again because it's so shocking to most people when I say it, that it kills more people than smoking and, uh, uh, and uh, as much as obesity. So it's a big killer of people. We, uh, our foundation runs helplines. Uh, we counsel people. Uh, we have uh, psychiatrists uh, and psychologists working for us. And we work uh, on stigma prevention programs so that people can acknowledge the illness in their families, uh, get treatment. We provide free treatment. And uh, uh, really, uh, we try and work in extensively with the government to improve the institutions for mental illness, which are terrible and Dickensian, mm -hmm. and none of us would like to ever visit. Uh, but that's the area that, uh, that we focus on. So, you know, this is something that you voluntarily decided to do, and this is not as part of your sort of corporate structure. But what the government in India is now trying to do is, in a sense, mandate corporate social responsibility, mandate corporate generosity. Do you think that's a good idea? Well, you know, either you have a conscience or you don't. It's hard to mandate that. But I think uh, the corporates in India if are doing if a fantastic gonna, job. If they're going to tell you to put 2% of your profits away every year, which you will, will then have to invest in healthcare, education, hospitals, whatever the case may be, do you think that is the, that is the way that India should go forward? Well, I think most corporates are, are doing a good amount of that anyway. We are certainly, other people are certainly. And I think the, the Indian corporates are extremely philanthropic when it comes to giving back in their communities. That being said, you know, uh, I suppose the taxes that we pay the government are also uh, towards these causes and must be used towards these causes. So should the so you're government... you no. Should the, no, I think they should. I don't think there's any problem in, in, in mandating that people should put more towards healthcare and education. And I don't think most of the corporates will... Uh, must be doing that anyway, the so I don't think... The company's bill has been stuck because, uh, because of corporate lobbying on this one particular clause. I mean, there's several others, but this one particular clause. So do you believe that Corporate India uh, uh, has a point when they say that this is not going to be an effective way of going forward? Or do you believe that this is just, uh, you know, it's a cop-out? I personally think the company's bill will do much more for companies than uh, the 2% that they put towards healthcare and education. That being said, I think if Indian corporates are holding that back, that's, uh, that's certainly not something that I would recommend. I think that we should invest heavily in healthcare and education for our own selfish interests yeah. and, and in you, training. And if you don't have the ability to manage it, come to us, we'll do it for you. <laughs> Arundhati, uh, what, would, what is the one thing that you have been able to drive by way of the change that you would like to see? Um, so I think the thing that we've done well through the organization is also for us uncovered layers of the problem which have shown us what the real problems are and that's, that's also frightening for us. Um, so in, I think what we've allowed is people in the cities of Bangalore and Mysore, especially a large number of them being corporates, to strike up very meaningful, authentic and real relationships with young people 
who come from very disadvantaged backgrounds and who just existed in the same space but not really interacted with yeah. them. So those kind of meaningful relationships, I don't think people, co companies were doing and these, and these volunteer mentors of ours were doing. But I think because of that, because we have more than a ringside view to, to these youth's life, we've also seen how difficult it is to make life choices as young people and that the negative influences are sometimes even stronger and how much work we have cut out for us. Um, in the last two weeks, we've grappled with one of our brightest mentees deciding to drop out of school and run away because the man quoting her were, it put so much pressure on her and said that he would not wait. So clearly that what work we're doing by giving her a role model and a mentor to build up her self-concept and self-esteem is not helping her make the right choice and hold out for a groom who will respect that. So, so that's, that's just cutting, showing us how much more work we have to do. But I'm, what I'm really glad is that we're really meaningfully engaging with our young people now and not just saying, oh, they take bad decisions because they take bad decisions. Uh, but trying to understand a little bit that goes on in their mind, what are the choices that a young girl at 16 has, and, and you know what affects her mental health? How can we actually help her make a right choice and know she has to hold out for someone, a better groom? So, so I like what we're doing and because it's showing us the real problems. That's, that's perhaps a choice that many Indian women have gone awfully wrong right. with anyway. But Prakta, let me come to you and ask <laughs> you about the one thing that you've, that you've been able to do. Uh, we have been, as I said, working with students because when we are talking about bringing a change in attitude, yeah. it becomes very difficult if I stand in front of a person of my age and tell them that, you know, please don't do this, this is not good for the environment. I would definitely say, please mind your do own you business. Do you get taken seriously in forums like this? Sorry? Do you get taken seriously in forums like this? I'm putting across my point, that's all <laughs> I can do. The same way, like, you know, I'm trying to wage a war against, it seems so at times because there are reactions that we get. Yeah. Uh, because the priorities are different for everyone. So what we are doing is we are targeting the, it's the softest target that we can say students and we are trying to bring those changes in them so that in future when we have su such kind of discussions, environment also be a part of it. How many students have you been able to counsel or how many people have you been able to send the message of environmental etiquette to so far and how many more do you intend to target? Uh, we are a very small organization. We work with around uh, five schools in Ahmedabad. So it's very, it's kind of a drop in the ocean. But we see that if this can be a successful model, it can be replicated elsewhere. And apart from that, we also do a lot of researches wherein we find out good environment friendly practices. Okay. And which are really very easily replicable across the country and even the globe and can solve a lot of environmental issues just, you know, by passing on the information and the correct uh, data sharing. Okay. So, Roini, Olympics next time around, you Absolutely. think? Absolutely. Yeah? So, do you believe that you've, you've been able to make some changes uh, to allow young women like yourself to get a shot at sporting glory and sporting history? So when I started sailing, I took part in my first nationals way back in 2000, and I was one of four girls who took part. And I came fourth, so. <laughs> um, I think now at the latest nationals, we've had over 75 girls uh, taking part wow. in sailing. And I've got into medicine on the sports quota in Tamil Nadu, and it was the first time uh, a girl from sailing uh, had made it through the sports quota to get into medicine. And I know that the government, the Sports Development Authority of Tamil Nadu, have quoted my case to, um, because I'm one of the very few sports people who continue my sport while I study medicine. Because there was a lot of talk about how the sports quota is just used to get, you know, people into good colleges, but yeah. they quit their sport. So I think I've given them hope that there are people like me and hopefully sports people out there who are very passionate about their sport and don't want to give up just because of education. I think we can balance it and um, I hope that I could be an example for a lot more women to take up the sport and not be afraid um, you know, to take it up seriously and for parents to let their ch children do the same. Because I think I've heard a lot of parents you know, worry about their children just constantly into sport and uh, yeah. They just put them into tuitions after school. I mean, I used to play, you know, and I think that's something that uh, is missing in our day. I know first standard students who go to tuitions after school. And I really hope that, um, you know, we could change that and bring a lot more play. That would also, you know, help prevent non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension. I think we have to address that and I hope we can.
Well, we wish you the very best of luck with your attempt, next attempt at the Olympics, Ashni. Uh, the one thing that you've been able to bring about in terms of change. I think uh, I've been able to push people working in lending to look at uh, human potential as a factor while deciding whether to lend to somebody. I think that currently the way lending works is you really just look at uh, does someone, ha someone have enough evidence of repayment, yeah. enough wealth to repay, and then only will you actually lend to them. Obviously, microfinance did it. Uh, did a lot to change that, but in education lending, this still happens a lot. Uh, one of the things I was able to do in the U.S. was um, uh, do a pilot at Stanford where we got people to invest in students' education in return for a share in their future income. So we really looked uh, for a fixed amount of time, and we really looked at uh, the students' earning potential, um, and we had investors share that risk with them. So I think, uh, though our pilot was small, and um, I'm working on a slightly different model here in India, I think... In the process of it, I was able to, I, I worked with a lot of people working in education, finance, yeah. banks, lenders, uh, and was, I think I was able to push the envelope on that. So what's the most frustrating thing that you've had to deal with? Well, going back to the idea of enforcement of contracts, I think that that's always uh, tough when it comes, uh, comes to lending. And I think that's uh, going to be a tough part of this business. All right. And let's, uh, final words from you in terms of the one thing that you've been able to change in Sri Lanka. Um. Yeah, I've been working on the government sector, so after the tsunami in 2004, so I've been trying to uh, change a uh, few things, how um, the government sector have been working, bringing a bit of efficiency. Uh, first, in the fisheries industry, um, I've managed to create about 17 fishery harbors in uh, Sri Lanka. A um, bit of change there, try to increase the fish catch um, of to about 250 thousand metric tons, a uh, few challenges I had, but I, I wanted to uh, increase um, more than 2% of the GDP, the contribution of the fisheries sector, Okay. Um, which I couldn't, but, um, but I, then I got involved in another sector, which is the foreign employment uh, sector. So again, try to do a little bit there um, of change, try to um, send more skilled migrants okay. than unskilled migrants. So right now I'm doing the National Reconciliation Conference, trying to bridge the community. Uh, we have a divided sort of, uh, you know, the Tamilian community at the Singhali. So yeah. we're trying to recognize the differences, bring both of them, blow both the communities together, and conduct, um, conducting the National Reconciliation Conference right now. Okay, excellent. So y you've, you've seen what our young uh, global leaders and our young shapers have had to say in terms of their vision for India and the ideas that they would like to build on to drive change in India. Any questions that you may have for our panelists here, we'll get a microphone across to you and uh, feel free. And if you can address them to any, any specific individual. Go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. I'm Arthur Mutambara, Deputy Prime Minister of Zimbabwe. I have a framework to share with the panelists and I want their comments on that on the broad issue of the national vision for India. What I propose is that we have the vision as a long-term aspiration with four pillars, society, the environment, politics, and the economy. Where do you want India to be in 30 years' time in those four? Having established that house on the top of the hill, you then ask yourself and say, what can I do now to take India from where it is to where I aspire to be in 30 years' time. Yeah. That's what we call strategy. What is the strategy which will take you from where you are to the house on the top of the hill? Then the third element of the framework is what values are going to drive you to achieve your vision? And also, what are some of the mega impact projects you can pursue to achieve your vision? What are the views of the panels to this framework? Do we even have a strategy approach here in India when it comes to thinking about India and our future, Siddharth Lal? Isn't that the big problem, that we don't have one? <laughs> yeah, I guess it is, uh, it is a problem because, like you said, there's you know, little shared vision in that sense. And you've put a framework which is you know, exactly how it should be framed. And I think we, we try to do the panel slightly differently, which is to sort of... But, but yes, that is the framework which, which is required. And, and I mean, I guess there is a... The potential is enormous, and I'm, you know, I want to make sure that it's seen that I'm exceedingly optimistic. So the potential is enormous, and I think a lot of the, uh, if I may say that, even if it may not be very well articulated, it's it's out there, the framework in terms of what we need to accomplish. It's the problem is now in the execution, in the yeah. in the nuts and bolts, and in actually getting things all together. 
Yeah, absolutely. We do have what we call the five-year plan here in India, but unfortunately, at the end of the five years, we realize that we haven't met any of those targets, and so we we go back and revise that plan and come up with another one. But hopefully, hopefully, we will be able to execute as per the plan uh, and as uh, as stated by the government. Yeah. But you know, I think uh, well, I I totally agree with you that when you're looking at a vision, it has to be outside in rather than inside out. But I think having said that. Uh, I think many of us in India are quite critical of ourselves and where things are. But if you look at things where India is today and where we were and how things have moved and evolved, I think we've come a long way. But the question is, could we have done more? Can we do it better? And the answer to both of those is yes. We certainly can do more. We can certainly do it better. And we can probably do it faster. There's enough learning from what we've done and what more we need to do. And if you talk to anybody in business, which there are many of the leaders sitting here, or even in government, they will have the answers. It's not that they don't know what needs to be done, but I think some of the current circumstances in the environment sometimes doesn't enable them to be able to execute it or create an enabling environment the way they actually want to make it happen. So we just need to get some of those issues addressed and resolved to be able to have a clear runway to run as fast as we can. Well, maybe, maybe we need to borrow Barack Obama's idea. We have a lot of potential, and yes, we can. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the final question here. If anybody has a question, we'll raise your hands, Hello. please. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, can I ask? Um, sorry, I somebody can't else asked. Right there, in the middle. OK, go ahead. Well, I have a two-part question. Um, one is, what's it going to take for people in India to stop littering? <laughs> and two, What's it going to take for each one of you to join the government? All right, who wants to go first? Who wants to go first? Priya, what's it going to take for you to join the government? Littering, I think, you know, just enormous fines. That's the only way we're going to probably be able to do that. Lucky for us, uh, we have a lot of wonderful young ministers in the government now. Not enough, not enough, <laughs> not enough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, one day we will be in the government. Why, why should we shut that door today? That's this is... Uh, there's certainly that, uh, that, is, that is certainly an option. So mm. I, I'm sure there are wonderful people here who should join the government and uh, will join the government. A anybody here who would be interested in, in getting into the government, uh, being a part of the political process in India? Any one of you, any of the shapers here? I, I think, you know, it's not, it's not that much about... I certainly hope a lot more youth and a lot more people continue to join the governance process and be a part of the government. But really, to make a change, to make a difference, you don't necessarily need to be in government. Okay. You can work with them, you can partner with them, and there's a lot to be done in the social sector, in the private sector, where you can drive change, where you can lead change. If your last name was Gandhi, Pilot, Sindhya, you wouldn't be saying this, would you, Malvinder Singh? <laughs> well, I'm not, and I'm Singh, and I'm here, and I, and I think from my perspective, I have a lot cut out to do in what we're doing in business. And I think we're in our own little way making a difference. And I'm sure as long as people are able to make a difference in what they believe, what they're passionate about, and what they're committed to, yeah. you will have a much stronger India emerging. OK. Um, yes or no? If we had a hypothetical situation yesterday in one of the meetings where we said in 2030, an anti-corruption party would win majority of elections in, in the urban vo the votes, the poor yeah. votes. If that happens, I think a lot Why? of Why? I mean, we have an anti-corruption party today. Winning. It could hopefully sort of make, yes. it to, make it to government in I 2030, but would you join the anti-corruption party today or not? Today, I would say, I would say what Why? you said, which Why? is that I'm doing a lot of impactful work in the sector that I chose, and I see enough to do here for the next 15 years at least. Okay. So none of you want to join Arvind K. Driwal, is it? But having said that, I think um, the transparency issue in itself will foster, you know, a, a meritocracy, and it will allow people who don't have these last names yes. to actually enter politics. All the young politicians are all, you know, they have last names. So it's, it's, you know, you don't have the type of crop of people coming in which you should actually be having. So, I mean, it, I don't think it's an individual issue here. I, I mean, I'm not... I don't think I'm going to join politics ever, but, but I don't think it's an individual issue. It's, yeah. it's that there are millions of brilliant potential pol politicians. They'll never get the opportunity today. Okay, so you got your answer. Nobody from this panel, at least, is going to be joining politics anytime soon. A final question uh, that I'm going to take. There was a gentleman there. Yes, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Singh. 
Um, first of all, kudos to your company for all the work that you have been doing. And you know, you talked about uh, accessibility, uh, reliability, affordability. However, a lot of that has been limited to uh, larger cities in India. So when we think about doctors, you know, most of them are in big cities, hospitals, mostly in big cities. What are your thoughts on increasing accessibility to, you know, in the rural areas? You know, so do you think the government has to play a leading role in that, or do you see private sector uh, stepping up? I think, uh, to just give you a background, today 75% of the healthcare infrastructure in India is run or owned, managed by the government, but 75% of the people who get treated get treated by the private sector. Uh, I don't think today it's humanly possible for the type of investment which is required in healthcare to be able to create healthcare infrastructure across the length and breadth of the country in the period that we need it, we'll need over $100 billion. And I honestly, no matter how many people put that money, I don't see that happening. So the way to address that is going to be through technology, is going to be through taking healthcare investments closer to people in tier two and tier three towns. Uh, many companies are doing that. You well, create, what, what, you what about, what, sorry, what about partnerships? For instance, in education, we've actually seen where, again, there's a lot of government infrastructure. Private operators are running the schools using government infrastructure. Can that not be a model that we can see uh, in healthcare in I India? was going to address that okay, as sorry, well. Sorry, I, preempt, I preempted you. I think, so clearly, I think the private sector in healthcare, you have investments happening there, but the question probably is, is it enough? And probably not. So we certainly need to make that investment. We need to use technology. And at the same point in time, there are public-private partnerships happening in healthcare. Healthcare is a state subject. And we do have some uh, public-private yeah. healthcare partnerships with different state governments. It's a start. It's doing well. But I think it needs to get scaled up. Okay. Uh, and that is something which I think over a period of time will happen. But you, know, you have to deal with different state governments, and they all have the different priorities and perspectives. So execution of that will take a little longer. Okay, it may be chaotic, it may be confusing, it may be a lot of noise at this point in time, but as you can see from our panelists here this afternoon, the underlying potential of India continues to be strong. We hope we will uh, be able to get rid of some of the baggage that we've been carrying of the past, and we hope that we will be able to uh, enter a much better, brighter, more robust future for India on the basis of the ideas that have been shared by our panelists here. And hopefully it'll be young global leaders and young shapers like you who outside the government or within the government will be able to drive some of the change that we have talked about this afternoon. I'm feeling a little more optimistic about the future of this country at the end of this. I certainly hope that all of you here this afternoon are feeling the same. Thank you very much to all of our panelists here for joining us this afternoon and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very much indeed.